Hello and welcome to our webinar, The State of Sales Negotiation. Buyers and sellers share what works and what doesn't in sales negotiation. This webinar is brought to you by Ring Group, a global sales training and performance improvement firm that helps companies unleash the sales potential of their teams. I'm Beth McCluskey, your webinar host. Before we get started, here are a few technical notes. We recommend you listen to this webinar with your computer speakers instead of phone. Be sure to exit all background programs to get the best sound quality. Use the Q&A pod on your screen to write in any questions and comments. We'll answer your questions during the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. We're recording this event. You'll receive an email next week with links to watch the recording and download a PDF of the slides. Now to introduce our speaker. Mike Schultz is president of Rain Group best-selling author of Rainmaking Conversations and Insight Selling, and director of the Rain Group Center for Sales Research. Mike and the team at Rain Group have worked with organizations like Toyota, Hitachi, Optus, Johnson & Johnson, and hundreds of others to improve sales performance. Mike, over to you. Okay, can everybody hear me now? This is great. I'm sure Beth will let me know if people can't hear me. Fabulous. Sorry about that, folks. So I'm very excited to be delivering today's webinar. We have been working on this project for nine months, but it's not just that we've been working on it for nine months, and this is the first time we're going to share some of the exclusive data from our top performance and sales negotiation research. But the, the most important point for me is that some of this is fascinating. And I think in a lot of webinars, a webinar about strategy, a webinar about leadership, a webinar about uh, leading better sales conversations. Yeah, sure, they can result in wins and it can improve your financial results and your sales results. But every single day, sellers are losing money that they don't have to lose because they literally don't know how buyers negotiate, aren't prepared for negotiations, don't know what's coming, don't know what's most effective, and just don't know what to do about it. And so they are discounting much more uh, than they need to be. And in fact, you know, for our top performers, they discount a lot less and we now have data on that. But let us hop in and look at what we are going to discuss today. So first, what is the impact of being a top performer in sales negotiation? What kind of results do you actually get? So we found that in our initial research years ago that six categories set top performers apart. Now we have specific data on those and that the, these six categories have been validated by research as well as now going on uh, close to 20 years of actual training and performance analysis in the field. Everyone says win-win is the best approach. Uh, there are a small number of folks that say, oh geez, you know, maybe it's not win-win. So the question is, based on data, based on actual negotiations, hundreds of actual negotiations, is win-win the best approach? What is the number one most common negotiation tactics buyers use on sellers? And in fact, is that tactic the most effective tactic buyers use on sellers? And if it's not, what are the other effective tactics? How effective are negotiation tactics buyers use on sellers in general? Of the 14 tactics that we study, which is the most effective seller negotiation tactic? So we looked at tactics from what are the tactics that buyers use on sellers and what are the tactics that sellers use with buyers? And by the way, I use the point buyers use on sellers because most of the tactics were not win-win kinds of tactics that the buyers use. They were tactics that were used on sellers to try to get price down, but more on that later. How important are budget vis-a-vis -vis what the buyers can actually pay? What drives procurement? Is it really cost or is it something else? And does sales negotiation training make a difference? So we will cover all of these fascinating answers. And my hope, my great hope, by the end of this webinar is you will have at least one thing. If you can spend about an hour and have one thing that you believe you want to try or you believe will help you be more, uh, more effective in sales negotiation, then we will have done our job. All right, so let's look at some of the boring stuff, uh, not boring to nerds like me, but I want to give you the sense of the scale and scope of the study, which is uh, at least when it focuses exactly on sellers, uh, unprecedented to the extent that I know about it. 
Uh, we studied 246 sellers across 26 industries. And as well, we looked at 449 buyers responsible for 2.59 billion in negotiated purchases over the last year. And as well, uh, we spanned across 26 different industries. We looked at different geographies and we have statistically significant sample sizes across geographies and across levels. So how does a top level person that might be C-level or VP negotiate differently than individual contributor? You might think, well, uh, individual contributors are unlikely to negotiate as well as a VP, except individual contributors are often people in purchasing departments who have studied negotiation. So it's not quite that simple. All right. Uh, just wanted to give you the sense that, you know, this is pretty wide, pretty deep and pretty rigorous research. And on all of the research that we did, um, this will be the end of the very boring, I hope analysis, but we did um, regression analysis. We did key driver analysis. We looked at all different kinds of analyses to find out what actually works and doesn't for buyers and sellers and how sellers should negotiate to get the best results. So let's take a look at a quick example that will help us see the impact of sales negotiation. So the average number of negotiations per year across top performers and the rest, and it was around one in five that were top performers based on our criteria, which I'll share in a minute. Uh, they both did 22 negotiations a year on average, so they're doing this. It's, and this is important to note because, well, does someone that do, does a lot more negotiations, are they a lot better? In fact, they're doing about the same amount, but their win rates on proposed sales and their win rates when they get to negotiation are quite different across the sales that they negotiated. Uh, we asked them how many that they won versus lost. And the top performers were able to figure out, to use a common standard negotiation term, they were figure, able to figure out how to get to yes. Uh, the question as well is, is that yes a good yes for them? We'll look at that shortly. But in fact, they did win more negotiated agreements. And then we asked the question, were these agreements the best possible or at least close to the best possible agreements for you? And they were much more likely to be uh, the best possible. Uh, and as well, that was often defined by people in the conversations that we had and in the verbatims that they did not have to discount quite as much. So of the top performers, again, about one in five uh, were top performers in, for the whole sample size. And for us, we had to think, we had to decide, well, what is a top performer in sales negotiation? So let's say you were extremely or very close to achieving your price target. You were extremely or very confident in the sales negotiation and you're very satisfied with the outcome. If you hold your price, you're satisfied with the outcome, you feel good about doing it, Ah, well, we think that that is something to be emulated and it turns out uh, that these folks did have better financial results. So let's take a look at what an example looks like of those financial results. Okay, it's a, it's a couple of bar charts and a couple of pies so far. What does it actually matter? Let's say you have an organization of 100 sellers. Why 100? Because it's more than 10, less than 1,000, it's easy to do math on. And let's say you have an average target price of 200,000 per sale. Why 200,000? Because we could have put in 20,000, we could have put in 2 million, it doesn't matter. So 100 sellers at 200,000 per sale, and they did 20 negotiations a year. Let's just pull it back from 22 to 20 because I'm in sales and I was under the impression there would be no math. And then we look at the actual results. The top performers, um, actually that's backwards. The top performers win 80% and the rest win 50%. And then the average price achieved top performers are 97% and the rest is 92. The actual difference in discounting was bigger than that. And we wanted to keep it pretty close to if I wanted to charge $200,000, for example, that I only ended up discounting several thousand dollars or a little bit more if I'm in the rest. So let's look at what the financial results are. Again, you look at this and you think, okay, whatever, a couple of different percentage points. If you look at it just as one seller, that's $3.1 million that they would win over the course of the year. Uh, if they won 80% of their 20 negotiations at 200,000 per, uh, per sale and minus a three percentage point cut in the price of that 200,000. But then if you take that 200,000, you cut it to 92% uh, and you change that win rate based on the actual results that we found. Think of it if you were the CEO of the organization. 
to be able to do $310 million in revenue versus 184 simply by the fact of having a full team be really good at negotiation. These are the actual numbers and the actual results with the, the change in the, the prices in terms of the discounting that they got, pretty slim. So this is a wild difference in negotiation success. It makes a difference. And in fact, just leaving the example of, of, of me doing math on that, uh, on what we found, uh, the top performers were 12.5 times more likely to be satisfied with the outcome. They were 3.1 times more likely to achieve their target pricing and their confidence was 3.5 times higher. These are, from a statistical perspective, huge gaps in difference. So it wasn't just like this was a little slim more than, than the other, but they were very different. One in five are literally this much better at negotiation. So takeaway number one, top performers are more confident and achieve stronger pricing uh, and they get better outcomes by huge margins. Okay, let's look at number two. What are the things they do differently? I could give you graphs, I could give you charts, I could make you fall asleep in five minutes. And for those of you that are still awake, nice job so far. But let me break down in layman's terms, in English language, what exactly do they do differently? And we have had this model for years and years, uh, but it is now statistically validated against that model. One, always be willing to walk. This is a mindset that sellers need to take. When buyers perceive a seller must make a sale, then they will push and push and push until the seller's breaking point, and they will push much harder when they perceive a seller to need the sale versus want the sale. You can want, but you can't need. Two, build value. The sellers that were good at changing the discussion from price to value, that's in the negotiation and as well, this is where sales skills come in. They were able to build value over the course of the sales cycle and enter negotiation being what we would perceive and in the discussions that we had with buyers, they might say something like, we have three providers we're considering. One of them is obviously the best choice. If you can have them say they're obviously the best choice, the question is why? And usually it's not necessarily about price. Okay, so they build value. They lead the negotiation. That has a couple of different parts and we can look at it big picture and tactically, but they literally take the lead. They set the agendas, they kick off the meetings right, they manage the process flow, uh, they make sure that they say things first. Um, they, they, they literally just, and it's not necessarily with a firm hand, but they guide the negotiation down the path instead of just waiting for the objection that the buyer brings up and waiting for the buyer to say something and then responding. Four, they affect emotions. Uh, you'll see that it's not A, affect emotions, it's E, affect, two different ways to look at the word. And affect with an E, like affect change, means to bring about. So they are able to draw in and elicit certain emotions from buyers and as well from themselves because negotiations are emotional affairs. Four, literally they, they just trade, they don't cave. Hey, can you lower your price? well, where do we need to be? That signals to the buyer, we're going to cave. And if you just say that sounds good, or let's work our way there, or let's split the difference, that is caving. Uh, that is not usually fair. And in fact, we did learn that the uh, top performers trade more and as well plan to win. A lot of the negotiation literature of guys that think, oh, I've seen a lot of negotiations. I'm going to say everyone should plan. Well, that's a good piece of advice, uh, except is that really true? Just like is win-win really true? In fact, planning to win is really true. The folks that are prepared for negotiation tend to perform much better. Now let's take a look because you are here knowing that this is a research presentation. Always be willing to walk. I, we were willing to walk away from the deal. 2.2 times more often with the top performers. Again, these were not the criteria for top performers. This was, did you get a better result? Were you more confident? Were you able to hold price? The ones that had the mindset that I was willing to walk away 2.2 times more. Building value. Approaches such as mutually uh, brainstorming new ideas and possibilities were used to build value. Uh, almost three times as much. I, we made the opening offer. This is more of a tactical thing versus a big picture. I led the negotiation process and set the agendas, but I made the opening offer. They took the lead in the conversation, say with price. 
2.4 times more often. I, we were prepared specifically in advance to manage emotion on both sides, 2.2 times more often. Trade don't cave. Conceded to your customer request or demand only when making a request of your own, uh, i.e. trading 2.7 time, 2.75 times more often, and then planning to win. I, we were prepared for the negotiation 1.7 times more often. So takeaway number two is as follows. Uh, the essential rules of sales negotiation are valid and they are valid to a high degree of statistical significance. Uh, so now I believe uh, we have coming up a poll and I would like to ask Beth to pull up the poll, which is which group is more likely to take a positional or distributed approach versus say win-win? They're gonna do the opposite of win-win. Which group is more likely to take a positional or distributive approach? Is it top performers, the rest, about the same, or neither? Uh, they both overwhelmingly take a win-win approach. So Beth, when you're ready, uh, just let me know when you want to pull up and if you could kindly share that poll result, that would be great. All right, so Beth, are you there? Did you pull up the results? Well, I can't hear Beth, so, and I might- Hi, Mike, I did pull up the results, so I'm sorry if you can't see them. I'm not sure what's happening on the screen here, but I'll go ahead and give you a readout. Great, So Thank at you. Top, top performers, we have 51%. The rest, we have 29%, about the same 9% and neither at 11 percent all right well in fact here we go uh, top performers are 3.25 times more likely to take a positional or distributive approach than the rest now so you think okay so they're not really doing win-win as much they're actually doing win-win quite often but what they do more than the rest is that they also know when and can take that positional or distributive approach. And usually it's when the buyer is being more positional or distributive. So the piece of the negotiation advice there is that if you only take a win-win, and they're literally, if you Google something like win-win negotiation training, some of the major companies that offer training in this area literally call it win-win negotiations. If you do that, you are literally taking a course that will lead you down the path to be less likely to be a top performing sales negotiator. At least that's what the research says. But at the same time, they know how to make sure that they lead the discussion, they affect emotions, and they are three, three times more likely um, to say that their client relationships are at trusted partner level. So in fact, what it seems like is that they manage a level of professionalism that when someone tries to beat them up, they just either signal through their uh, words, their body language, their interaction style and type that, yeah, maybe even just, I appreciate you asking, but no, and they establish this peer level type relationship that makes it much more likely for them to generate a better uh, and hold a better, um, hold a better relationship. All right, so Beth, uh, why don't you pull up the next poll? Uh, and the next poll goes as follows. What is the number one most common tactic buyers use on sellers? Is it uh, require seller to negotiate in very tight time frames. Meet us in the middle. A competitor will accept this if you don't. Share a low budget up front to set the stage for bargaining starting at a low price, or we need a better price. And they say something like that. So which one do you think is most common? I'll read them one more time. And then Beth, if you could do a verbal readout, that would be fabulous. So require a seller to negotiate in very tight time frames. Meet us in the middle. A competitor will accept this if you don't share a low budget upfront to set the stage for bargaining at a low price, and we need a better price. Okay, I Great, can Mike. see it. So it looks like we have, oh, can you see those? I can. Okay, fabulous, I'll let you do the reading. All right, require a seller to negotiate in very tight time frames, which is 4%, meet us in the middle, which is 9%, competitor will accept this if you don't, which is 10%, 
share a low budget is 19% and we need a better price is 58%. Ding, 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 you guys are the best. We need a better price is the number one most common tactic. How much fun, we need a better price. It is the most common thing that buyers tend to say. It is the most common things that sellers perceive that they say. It is very, very common. Now let's take a look at how well it works. So uh, we could look at the percent of how well it works, but I wanna look at it in terms of the stack of where it stands compared to some of the other common tactics that I mentioned. So what is the number one most effective tactic buyers use on sellers? Require sellers to negotiate in very tight timeframes. Meet us in the middle. A competitor will accept this if you don't. Share a low budget up front to set the stage for bargaining at a low price. We need a better price or none of the above. I'll read them one more time and Beth, uh, once I'm done, you can go ahead and pop them up. Require sellers to negotiate in very tight timeframes. Meet us in the middle. A competitor will accept this if you don't. Share a low budget up front uh, to set the stage for bargaining starting at a low price. And we need a better price. And then finally, uh, none of the above. So let's see what we got. All right. So the number one that we picked here was a competitor will accept this if you don't. Then it was share a low budget. Then we need a better price. Then starting to drop down. Uh, we have require sales to negotiate, meet us in the middle, and three of you said none of the above. And in fact, the answer is none of the above. The most effective tactic that buyers use on sellers, according to the buyers, this works, according to the buyers, is something else. Now, I'm not going to reveal to you exactly what that is uh, because um, have to leave a little bit to mystery. You can always pick up a copy of the report, but these are the factors that we looked at. What I will share with you is that all of the tactics range between 63% and 85% effective or very effective. Buyers use these and they all work. In fact, the point is, is that they all work way too well. And this is something that we found about um, the sellers in terms of their skills, we understand why they work so well because the sellers, at least according to the buyers and often according to the sellers themselves, really just don't feel super confident and comfortable for what to do when they are faced with all of these different situations. All right, so this was a research, uh, this is a research uh, revealing webinar and it's a ton of fun to do polls. So let's do another one. What is the number one most effective tactic that sellers use. This is according to the buyers. What is the thing for them that they say works the best? Making time-based offers, oh, do it by the end of the month and you're gonna get the best deal or the best something or I'll throw in the mud flaps or whatever it might be. Time-based offers present best, better, good options. That might be the way to get the best results, the way to get the best deal, the way to get the best, um, you know, the, the best outcome here is this. Uh, you could back it up. Um, pay a little bit less and do this, or you could back it down and this would still be fine, but it might not be the quote unquote top of the line. Um, come in on a high price at first and expect to negotiate down. Uh, present multiple offers at the simultaneously, the sellers uh, valued equally, so different than best, better, good, but just here are three ways to go about it that are uh, similar. And then set an anchor by establishing a solution framework, price and agreement terms. I would say, Beth, go ahead. Why don't you uh, pop up what we have for results? Uh, the number one was setting an anchor. Number two was best, better, good. Number three was a tie, time-based offers and multiple equivalent simultaneous offers. And then four is uh, coming in high on price and then expecting to negotiate down. Well, in fact, the number one tactic that sellers use is presenting what everyone thought was number three, multiple equivalent simultaneous offers. Now, interesting, less than one in five actually employ the tactic, but the top performers, and this is from the seller side, said it was effective or very effective 73% of the time. And I'm going to say that it was much more effective for top performers than a whole bunch of the other tactics. So it seems that this is one of those tactics that is value driving because it helps 
It helps the, the buyer buy in a way that might feel fitted to them, that feels right, but that the seller would say, here are three good ways to go. So presenting multiple offers simultaneously at the seller value equally was the number one most effective tactic of sellers. Uh, and it was pretty effective across all of the different uh, seller tactics. So Mezzo also, it only ranked ninth out of 14th most commonly used. So the number one most effective is in the latter half of the list. All right, so quick poll. If a buyer has a budget, uh, on average, they don't have the flexibility to pay more if they want to, true or false? I'm gonna read it one more time, we'll pull it up real quick. If a buyer says, here's my budget, $50,000, on average, they do not have the flexibility to pay more if they want to. All right, Beth, go ahead and let's see what percents we get for true and false. Uh, false, and I think I popped it up right there. That is true. It is true that it's false, right? So most buyers can pay more. This is what the buyer said. We have the flexibility to pay more for the solution if the supplier demonstrating why doing so was worth it. So if you want to get more money, have better selling skills, have better negotiation skills. This is literally about the communication of the value case, getting it from your head into their head. And if you can get it from your head into their heads, then they will actually be able to pay more. Uh, I actually just went through a purchasing process myself, which was a B2B purchase of something that was probably over the course of the life going to be somewhere in the six figures, but it could be in the millions of dollars. So this is a you know, pretty serious purchase from an annual perspective. And uh, I would say that when everyone asked me what the budget was. And the response was, I'm going to buy this. Help me understand what I'm buying and what it is because I don't have a budget. It's my company. We've already decided that we need something like this. And I don't know exactly what it costs. I know a little bit of ranges. I know what I think I should pay for it, but I know I'm buying it. So go ahead and impress us. This was a B2B service-based um, service based sale that would be something that adds someone to our team on an ongoing strong basis that should be for years. And I'm gonna say that their, their, their selling and negotiation skills by and large were really, really bad. But I'm gonna say we did less negotiation because we didn't push much in negotiation. We literally just wanted the best provider. Um, however, their selling skills were awful. So they, we could have paid, we would have paid 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 dollars more a month if we knew why. If we knew what it would, uh, how it would be valuable to us. So um, that's the takeaway. 62% of buyers strongly agree and agree that they can pay more if they choose. Now, a lot of the people said, I neither agree nor disagree. So uh, what's notable is that only 16% disagreed or strongly disagreed. So only 16% were on the other side of neutral to that, which I think is, it's more than I thought and it's pretty wild. Now we always say a lot of buyers don't just rely on budget. A lot of buyers can pay more and it turns out that the great majority can. So uh, that's a, that, that was a, a matter of degree that was pretty surprising to us. Okay. Let's continue to move along. The purchasing department's mission. I'm going to read you a mission statement. And uh, one of the things that we found particularly fascinating about uh, this research and this webinar was we were able to get a large group of career purchasing professionals to share with us uh, all sorts of things about what it's like working with sellers, all sorts of things about what it's like actually trying to be a purchaser, what they do and what they don't do. It was pretty wild. And when we asked people verbally, what is it that you guys try to do as a purchasing department? And they would say something like purchasing is dedicated to providing and managing for our customers, the most effective and efficient procurement process and procedures for the acquisition of quality goods and services in support. This is one that I actually found missions and goals, but read this primary consideration is to provide the best possible quality goods and services to our condition constituents with the price being secondary to quality. This is pulled verbatim from what I would say are the most common mission statements that I can find publicly stated 
for purchasing departments. They are literally saying, we are trying to bring value to the organization. And I'm telling you upfront, our mission is to make sure that everyone knows that we will of course consider price, but it is secondary to quality and trying to achieve what it is that we need to achieve. Uh, this is what they say. Now, Beth, why don't we go ahead and pick out uh, another poll. So what is more important to most procurement departments according to the purchasing professionals themselves? This is when we ask them in the research. So this is not what we pulled off of the web. This is what we asked well over 200 purchasing professionals. So we also did not give them a list. We just asked them the question. This was open and we coded by hand over 200 uh, responses. What is the most important to procurement departments um, according to the purchasing professionals themselves? We just asked them, what is the most important factor for you of what you're trying to achieve uh, uh, for, your, for your overall uh, group or division? So was it something that they said about cost or was it something that they said about something besides cost? And so for us, it, the, the things that they said were uh, delivery, terms, quality, margin, uh, time, uh, return on investment, product availability, KPIs, and whatever they are, and meeting them, uh, the process, uh, budgets, and everything else. So Beth, let's pull up what people think the purchasing department told us. So this is, everyone thinks, so it looks like 80% said it was the combined sum of the other things, and 20% said cost. So let's go ahead and move on to what they said. This is the full data. So when they said cost, price, cost factors, cost savings, cost compared to the others, getting the biggest discounts. When we added all of these up and it was literally like just cost, how much it costs, getting the best cost. Um, and sometimes it was about, you know, those cost savings or discounts that I was able to negotiate cost, cost, cost down. They said that 62% of the time. After that, it was delivery terms, quality, margin, time, ROI, product availability, product, KPIs, process, budget. Budget could have even made it 63%, but when we looked at the verbatims, it was literally not quite about cost, but whether they could or couldn't buy based on what they were trying to do. Um, so that was a factor, but when they literally just said it's about how much it costs, it was 62% of the time. So this is, a huge thing for us that we have found. And that's takeaway number nine, which is despite value missions in public statements otherwise. And I was a speaker at uh, a major purchasing professionals conference. All they talked about was quality and value and bringing quality and value and making sure that we're actually getting the outcomes that we want and doing ROI analysis uh, to make sure it's the right things and things aren't apples to apples. When they get back to their desk, something is being lost in translation that despite the value missions and the public statements otherwise, 62% of purchasing professionals stated that cost was the number one factor uh, that was their success metric. And I think that that is pretty wild. Okay, moving right along to number 10, negotiation, training, and top performance. Only one in four sellers uh, has received extremely effective sales negotiation training. Yet, top performers received extremely effective training 9.3 times more often. The top performers, if we literally just ask them, have you uh, received extremely effective negotiation training? 65% of them said yes, and literally of the rest, only 7% uh, said yes. This seemed to us to be a wild difference. And this is the kind of thing where people ask us, so can you really teach someone to sell? If they don't have selling in their bones, can you teach them, you know, can they within two years, if you teach them and coach them and work with them, can they literally turn the corner and be able to sell? And sometimes the answer to that is yes, and sometimes the answer is no. We often say something like, you know, how many, uh, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Well, you might know the answer, it's one, but the light bulb has to want to change. Uh, so you really have to want it. If someone really wants it, they can learn to be a better seller. When it comes to negotiation, it's much more tactical. If they know what's coming, if they know how to plan, if they know the factors that drive success, if they have a really good handle on what, what they are likely to see, 
and they have a pre-plan in advance set of responses, about 90%, I would say, if you plan well or something that you can't anticipate. Sometimes you get thrown something out of left field. 90 plus percent of the time, you can't anticipate it. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you learn in sales negotiation training. Um, we've been doing sales negotiation training for years. Um, and our, our mission statement uh, at Rain Group, our purpose is to drive client results. That's all we want to do. If we had training that we saw was not actually a factor in driving client results, we wouldn't have it. But this is one of the, this one in prospecting say, are two of the easiest things that after training, is it actually happening? And we tend to find that the answer is yes, when it works out really well. So let's go ahead and summarize. And then I think we have about 10 minutes for Q and A. So let's summarize. Uh, Number one takeaway, the top performers achieve better results by far. Not a little, not a moderate amount, but the financial difference in terms of their wins, in terms of their, their ability to win at higher prices and hold price, in terms of their ability to sell value over price, and in terms of their ability to make sure that while they are negotiating, they, they actually build respect in the buyers versus lose respect. The top performers in sales negotiation, even more than some of our other top performance analyses, they achieve better results by far. Two, top performers apply the six essential rules of sales negotiation. Uh, now, I don't have it pulled up right here, but you can remember those if you can remember the acronym ABLE to prevail. Uh, and that is that always be willing to walk. Uh, B is for build value. L is for lead the negotiation. E is for effect emotions, T for, you know, able to, T is for trade, don't cave, and P for prevail is plan to win. So the six essential rules of sales negotiation, uh, it was something that we practiced, honed, studied, uh, and put together, but now we have one of the largest research in sales negoti negotiation ever that has validated it. Number three, top performers take the right approach, and it's not necessarily win-win. They do take win-win uh, approaches, especially when the buyer is win-win and trying to figure something out and they drop in to figure something out. But if someone says, um, if you can buy, if, if uh, I'll buy right now, if you do this, they don't necessarily just say, sure, sure, here you go. Uh, they, they know how to respond to that, continue to win and not necessarily just cave, uh, especially when the buyers are literally just trying to get um, a lower price or more, uh, more on the solution for the same price. The buyer's number one most common tactic is we need a better price. You might guess it's the we need a better price and it actually is the uh, we need a better price. However, the buyer's most effective tactic um, uh, is not in even the five most commonly used and it's not we need a better price. It was something different. All buyer tactics, however, that we studied are between 63% and 85% effective. They just happen to be much less effective with uh, sellers who have had really good negotiation training. Uh, the most effective yet infrequently used tactic of top performers is multiple equivalent simultaneous offers. Buyers like choice and it wasn't necessarily about, and I think in the conversations that we've had, if it was a best, better, good, sometimes it does work and they appreciate the different levels that they can buy at, but they always feel like they're sacrificing something. It doesn't feel as good if they can't quite go at the highest level or they just know that I'm kind of paying through the nose for this, but I'm getting the top of the line. If the sellers say, here are three ways to go about this, and I think all three of them, or even two of them, I think they're gonna get you the same result. They're just different paths, and I wanted to present you an option. It really worked well. Uh, buyers mostly, that's 60% of them, can pay more than their stated budgets. In fact, again, it was in, this, uh, in the teens, I think it was 16%, uh, were the buyers that said, I can't pay more than my stated budget. So 62% said, absolutely, yes. Uh, and a whole bunch in the middle said, I'm neutral on the answer to that question because I'm sure it's in, it depends for them. But only a few people say that I can't. Uh, exceptions exist, uh, but procurement, it is true, is overwhelmingly cost-driven. 62% uh, said that cost was their number one success metric. So they might have 
public statements to the difference. They might tell you in their conversations that, yeah, sure, cost is a factor, but you can see right here, it's six out of the seventh in the deciding factors of this negotiation. But what they're actually measured on by their teams, their bosses, and what they measure themselves on is cost. Uh, at least that's what they told us. And then number 10, uh, top performers are 9.3 times more likely to receive extremely effective negotiation. So uh, I appreciate you listening to this. It was truly a wild study. Uh, it was fascinating to see all of the data. And I think the important thing is, is that this is one of our most, uh, most tactical, easiest to use studies. So if you find yourself negotiating, if you find yourself sometimes losing when you think you should win and you're right at the altar and it had to do not with um, the other provider was a better provider, but they just, you know, the buyer just picked them and you might've been outmaneuvered. As hard as that is to think about and as hard as that is to accept sometimes, you were outmaneuvered at the end and the buyer perceived the other one to be a better option regardless of where the price was. If you're dropping price, if you're losing negotiations, if you feel like you're just not confident enough or your teams aren't confident enough, and you're literally just doing this to the extent where it's you know more than hundreds of dollars, it's completely worthwhile. And for most sellers, it's tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars a year at stake just for them personally, then it's probably worth it to look into how do I get better at sales negotiation. So with that, I will turn it back to Beth uh, to bring us through the end and then I believe Q&A. Great, thanks Mike. Um, so if you are interested in the results that we shared in this webinar, we have all of our results compiled in an 81 page report with over 100 graphs and charts and analyst commentary. You can access that research at raingroup.com slash negotiation. And for all webinar registrants today, we have 25% off the report, which we'll be sending an email out afterwards with your coupon code. So make sure you watch your email for that. Now let's get to Q&A. We have some really great questions. The first one for you, Mike, since procurement is overwhelmingly cost driven, how do you manage the cost barrier even if you're trying to sell value? Ah, so this is a really interesting kind of thing. Uh, and I'll tell you something that we found in the research and the discussions that we've had. The business buyers inside of companies, you might think either they're just not communicating with the purchasing people or they're not in lockstep uh, or maybe they are, they are communicating, but it just feels, feels odd and you hear different things. We actually heard from the business buyers, some of them hate working with purchasing, can't stand working with purchasing. They say they're just so cost driven and it kind of drives me crazy. And they have to, over the objection and the choice of procurement, tell them that I can't buy it from those people. I have to buy it from someone else because I'm the one that has to live with it. I'm the one that has to make the right choices. I'm the one that has to deal with the problems that are happening here and we're paying a little bit more. So I think the interesting thing to consider is that sometimes there's not that much that you can do with procurement, but you have to, if you head into it with a plan and say, okay, this procurement department is very cost driven. Is there someone here that cares about value? And if that's the case, make them a coach to say, you know, Fred, uh, we are trying to figure out how to drive success in nine months for you to break into three different markets that is with an unknown future, but a well-worn path to do it. And it seems like we're the right fit. Uh, I'm worried right now that we are going to get overly squeezed from procurement to the point where we're going to diminish our ability to actually achieve that very achievable but still uncertain outcome. What thoughts do you have? Leave them to me. You put in your real price. I know you guys have to be paid for value. I'll take care of it. Or they can be cagey about it or something else. But if you dive in and just start putting together a list of things to say, how do I deal with this? You can also deal with it head on with purchasing. You can say something like for us to be able to do it, it's going to need to be here. And if they say, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. You have to know if that's your walk away point. Or you can go back and say, all right, so what you're saying is, is you can't, I'll put, pull around a number. You cannot spend $110,000. If it's over $100,000, essentially you're out. Here's what we'll do for 100, but this is the thing that we can't do if we're not doing it for 110. Dear business buyer, is this going to work for you? 
And if they say no, you can say them we're out. So you have to know where your walk away point is, or you can think of something to say, <coughs> excuse me, I'm willing to do it for a hundred. Are you willing to do a video testimonial for our website about the results that you get? Should you achieve results? And will you stipulate to that on paper? That could be worth $30,000 to your marketing department. Your boss might say, I won't ding you on your commission if you actually do that because we'll win the deal and you'll trade for value. So we could make this list. We could go on and on. But the point is, is that you just don't have to cave. And if pro procurement is stonewalling you, you know, there are, there are ways to approach it. Even I'll say one more thing. When Brick Cameron says, you're not allowed to talk to the business buyer, that's a problem. But in more than half of the cases, when that is actually true, sellers talk to the business buyers. The question just is, do you have the relationships and do you have the skill to make sure that that's you and not the other guy? Thanks, Mike. So speaking of your walk away point, should your walk away point be determined prior to the start of the negotiation? Yes. Great. And how can you be sure you're talking to the decision maker? You can't because sometimes the decision makers say, this is my decision. And then you lose the deal when they say it went up two levels higher. And um, I'm sorry, I got caught and I thought that I could do this, but I couldn't. Except they don't usually say that. They usually just disappear on you. That's the reality. That's what happens. But the things that you can do, you can't make sure, but you can certainly stack the odds in your favor. And don't just say who's the decision maker, because they might say, I'm the decision maker and say, all right, it's my understanding that as a decision maker, your part of the role is to make sure that if you choose something to do here, that it actually gets you the best business result. You're in charge of the division. Yes, that is correct. We call um, that person, uh, the one that is in charge of the driving a business result, we call them the business driver. But if you ask them the question is to say, from a financial perspective, from a literally signing the document and approving this purchase, even if you have the budget or financial with wherewithal to do it, does anybody else need to sign? When you say it like that, they'll say, oh yeah, the CFO. Because a lot of times the CFO and the business driver says, it's all set up, we agreed to it before, we're doing it and the CFO rubber stamps it. But we all know that sometimes that happens and sometimes it gets caught. And the CFO says, yeah, yeah, sure, it's 200,000. Just make sure they come back at 150. Well, you can find that out by asking the question in a specific way. And you can say, let's loop them in early. And then you can ask them the question to say, how often when you're buying something, if it turns out to be 200, that no matter what it is, they say, make sure you do it for 150 because they play that game with you. If so, then we might come in at 230 so we can be at 200 because that's what you need to succeed. But you need to just start, this is where thinking and planning in advance and understanding who the buyer types are. Because when people say decision maker, it's not good enough. There are five types of decision maker. A is approver, and that's who we're talking about is the person that signs the check. B is a business driver. That's the person trying to drive an ROI, but someone else might still sign the check or when they sign the deal, they might, someone else might also sign the deal. C is a champion, which is better than a coach because a coach tells you information and a champion can tell you information. But if you use the word coach, coaches don't run around and sell internally for you. Sometimes you need to turn someone into a passionate champion that sells for you. That's why we go with champion over coach. Uh, D is for the domino. And you have to ask yourself, um, in most of your sales, even if there's a buying committee, there's one person that if they say, I want to go down this path, everyone else sort of follows along. In 90% of sales, there is a domino. There is a person whose decision has the most weight. Find the domino. Make sure that they're in your camp. And then E is evaluator. These are all decisions that are going to be made. But you have to get beyond decision maker when you think about it. And using the word economic buyer isn't good enough because is the economic buyer the guy trying to drive ROI? Well, it could be. But usually that's defined as the person that signs the check. That could be the CFO. And if you're just looking for the CFO, then you're not focusing on the business driver. So you have to use the proper language to identify the buyer types and then use the proper questions to get to them. Awesome, Mike. One more question. If you could name one thing top performers do better than everyone else that I could start doing today, what would it be? Well, of course, we have using the little known 14th out of or ninth out of 14 factors uh, to build multiple equivalent simultaneous offers. Uh, that is certainly one thing. But I think the, 
the biggest thing that is the difference is the level of confidence. So we do uh, studies that you know, can be upwards of a thousand different people around the world, but we also talk to folks because we want to say, well, what did you mean by that? And what actually happened there? And I would say it's confidence. And when you're, it's almost like uh, if you have a whole bunch of sellers in the room, like, oh yeah, I know what I'm doing. I'm a seller. I have to, you know, have a certain amount of swagger and I'm not going to let them see me sweat in front of my peers and you know, in front of my, my manager and all that. And that's kind of like what purchasing departments say when they say it's more important to have value over price. But when you ask them privately and confidentially and they have no reason to lie to you, they're like, I hate this. I'm so scared. The number one emotion associated with negotiations, this is not from our research, but from um, the world of just straight up negotiation research, the number one emotion most, um, uh, most connected to negotiation is anxiety. That's the most. So if you can start getting rid of the anxiety, and I have to tell you, when uh, I both got a car recently uh, and as well um, purchased some business to business kinds of things, I couldn't wait. What are they going to do? What are they going to try? But I certainly wasn't worried about what they were going to try. And that's not to say that I'm God's gift to, to negotiation, but I was literally looking forward to this part of the dynamic to see how it actually played out. Uh, and a lot of the sellers just want to curl up and die when it's time for negotiation. So if you can change that confidence level and you can have them know what to expect, know how to respond, understand the dynamics of negotiation, see the fundamental components that make a negotiation work, get some practice with them, that confidence can shoot up off the charts and you'll look a lot more like top performers. And I'm going to shoot one more at you, Mike, because it's kind of fun. That's a great background outside your window. Is it real and where is it based? Oh yes, uh, welcome to my home office. Uh, I will tell you exactly where this is. This is lovely Lake Boone in Stowe, Massachusetts, uh, where I live. It's even awesomer in the summer. Uh, the lake is frozen over and if it was a nice day and not raining, you'd see people ice fishing and skating and all of that fun kind of stuff. There's even a dude that rides around on um, a motocross bike, which is kind of cool. Um, certainly not me since I can barely pedal my own bike without falling over, but it's a lot of fun. And in the summer, it's great for uh, water skiing and fishing and just generally jumping off the dock and enjoying yourself. So yes, I am at the home office today. Thanks for asking. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. So that concludes our webinar and Q&A. Just a reminder that we recorded this event. All attendees will receive an email next week with links to watch the recording and download a PDF of the slides. And make sure you watch your email for that discount code for our Top Performance and Sales Negotiation Benchmark Report. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day.